Hello and welcome to the Discover Virginia Beach podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Trahan, your tour guide to the Virginia Beach area. If this is your first time listening, I am so glad you found this show. Each week, I publish a new interview with locals ranging from musicians, government officials, CEOs, artists, and much more. And my aim is simple. It's to help you discover, define, and then go out and do exactly what you're looking for during your next vacation, relocation, or outing to the Virginia Beach area. And if you're looking to join in on the conversation, take part in monthly giveaways, and get your hands on my custom event calendars, head on over to Facebook and send me a friend request. That's Joseph Trahan. And check out my Facebook group of nearly 50,000 fans of the Virginia Beach area. Don't worry about writing anything down. The links for each episode along with the Facebook groups will be in the description below and also in the show notes. All right, here's the show. Today, I am very excited and proud to introduce to you Bob Pizzini, a veteran speaker, consultant, and award-winning CEO of iFly Virginia Beach Indoor Skydiving. We're very excited to kick off this conversation with you, Bob. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you so much, Joseph. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, as we start with every episode, love to know what brought you originally to the Virginia Beach area, and of course, what got you to stick around and build your life and business here? Yeah, I think those are great questions. Those are very important and relevant questions. So what brought me here was my military career. Uh, I was stationed here early in my career uh, from, I want to say, like 88 to 88 until 92. 1980, that's 1988 until 1992 for our younger audience. And um, so I was I was here for four years. And then I was gone for the next 20 or 18 or 20 years. And Came, came back in uh, 2006, and uh, so we landed here in 2006. I did four more years of my military career, retired in 2010. At that point, uh, our children, we had twins, a boy and a girl. They were uh, five years old, and my wife and I decided that Virginia Beach would be a great place to raise our kids. So we decided to stay and make Virginia Beach our home. Absolutely. As very similar for a lot of folks here, when you have the kiddos and you have a school district, that's, you know, quite, quite frankly, very phenomenal. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to pass it up for sure. Uh, well, Bob, I understand you've had a very diverse career from being a Navy, uh, you know, being in the Navy and you were a Navy diver, correct? And the also Navy a diver. EOD yeah. Technician. And EOD. So Navy diver, initially a deep sea, deep sea salvage diver, US Navy deep sea diver. Uh, and then uh, I discovered this awesome thing called Navy EOD. So then uh, spent most of my career as a Navy EOD technician. Wow, those sound uh, very technical uh, and also pretty cool jobs. I mean, you know, you, you think of a Navy diver. I mean, you go in uncharted territory, uncharted waters. Uh, any um, any interesting stories uh, when it comes to the, your diving days that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, I, I, you know, the 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 one that I've been sharing most recently is one I'm not terribly proud of, but it's one I almost drowned in 90 feet of water um, off wow. of Guam. And uh, uh, briefly, uh, you, you know, what I'm going to talk about here is is how important a team is. And, um, you know, I, I was a, uh, uh, an officer at this point, a very, very senior in my career, um, a leader. Um, I've got probably thousands of dives under my belt at this point. And we're in 90 feet of water picking up ordnance uh, World War II, leftover World War II uh, bombs, basically, and uh, rockets. And uh, so there was a basket placed on the bottom, sandy bottom. And basically, there was this, this old crate that had deteriorated and opened up and all this ordinance kind of laid out across the ocean floor. And we were picking up, uh, myself and my dive buddy, Leon, we would pick up a piece of ordnance and walk about 10 feet to where the crate was and drop it in the crate and go back and forth and back and forth. And of course, as we're doing that, uh, sand is kicking up and this beautiful blue water with great visibility became very turbid. And, you know, at that point, visibility was was no more than a foot or so. But we knew where we were going and what we were doing. Anyway, the Navy recently changed, Navy diving recently changed the requirement to have what was called a J valve. And this J valve has a little reserve um, quantity of air. We went to a K valve and a K valve has no reserve quantity of air. And uh, so we were working very hard and I looked at my pressure gauge and I said, okay, I think I can go get one more. 
bring it and then it's time to go up. Well, I went to get that one more and completely ran out of air. And so now my choices are I'm out of air and it's 90 feet to the surface or my dive buddy, Leon, is he's within 10 feet of me somewhere. Uh, so do I go up or do I go look for Leon? And uh, because we all carry uh, uh, a spare regulator, you know, an emer emergency air for your buddy, for your sure. dive buddy. And we were wearing a full face mask at that time. So I decided to go look for Leon, knowing he was somewhere very close. And it didn't take me very long to run into him. I uh, peeled my mask off. I gave the signal and he provided the uh, the emergency air and we hugged each other and surfaced together. So it's not a story I'm terribly proud of. I should have uh, I should have done a much better job, but but I followed procedure. Leon followed procedure, and the crew on the surface followed procedure, and uh, everything ended well. So that's uh, there's one C story for you. Wow, wow, absolutely. I mean, gosh, that must have been very um, very compelling time, very intense moment for for both you and Leon, hoping that you would find him and also he would remember the signal and everything that went along with that, um, which. Wow. When, when was this, Bob? Uh, this was uh, probably 2004, 2003, 2004 timeframe. So I was stationed in Guam from 99 to uh, 2004. Gotcha. So, gotcha. So, so that's just one story. And, and that's probably the, that's probably amongst the, uh, uh, you know, the, the most dramatic, uh, most of my other Navy dives, even diving on ordnance and recovering explosives and detonating explosives underwater, um, you know, all very procedural, all very safe in terms of the way we approach things. Uh, I, I was brought up under great leadership. And uh, so I have great appreciation for number one leadership and number two, the team dynamic and how important the team dynamic is. Sure, absolutely. I, it sounds like these experience, you, you know, these experiences kind of, you know, uh, impacted you in a way that has really influenced the way you approach, you know, your, your life, your business, and also leadership in general. I, I'm, I'm curious, um, coming out of the Navy days, uh, and into, you know, what people typically refer to as civilian life, what inspired you to venture into, uh, into indoor diving, indoor skydiving? Yeah. So, um, so in, in Navy EOD, we are a special operating force. Uh, and so Navy EOD, our, our primary job is to render safe explosives, to locate explosives, to identify explosives, and then cut the red wire or cut the blue wire, right? You have to, uh, we have to do what we have to do to render safe uh, explosive devices. So, so in, in EOD, diving is a mobility skill. It's how we get to explosives that happen to be underwater or other underwater problems. Uh, parachuting is also a mobility skill. And fast roping and repelling out of helicopters is a mobility skill. Having a helicopter recover us in various uh, manners uh, are mobility skills. It's how we get to and from the objective. So military free fall parachuting is a mobility skill that, uh, that Na Navy EOD technicians are qualified in. And one of my last assignments uh, before I retired, I was responsible for all the sustainment and advanced airborne training and sustainment and advanced uh, diver, diver training for about 1200 EOD techs here on the East Coast. In the airborne role, we would travel to vertical wind tunnels in different parts of the country uh, and use those facilities because a vertical wind tunnel for, for military freefall personnel is a simulator. Just sure. like a, a fighter pilot goes in a building and sits in a simulator and flies an F-18 mission, um, we conduct the free fall component of, of uh, free fall insertion in, in a simulator or in vertical wind tunnels. So we would travel to different parts of the country. We would use these facilities. We would see all the other operational units from Virginia Beach at these same locations. Um, but then we would also see the, to use your words, the civilian business model, uh, which is mom, dad, and the kids out having a wonderful Saturday afternoon, you know, Sure. Uh, so we would always travel back to Virginia Beach, either driving back or flying back from wherever we were. And there was always discussion about how we need an iFly in Virginia Beach and we can't believe there's not one here and what a great business model it would be for this area. And it would reduce travel time for active duty folks and it would provide this wonderful thing for people to do. And um, I got serious about that question one day. Uh, you know, there's all these all these rumors and incorrect information about why there wasn't one here. And I just started tracking all these, all these, uh, 
all these scenarios down and all these questions down and sure. found out that there wasn't actually, a, there was an opportunity for me to develop uh, the business model here in Virginia Beach. And so six years after I thought it was a good idea is when we opened our doors. Wow. That, and that's uh, what a missed opportunity for other folks. You know, I, I wonder how many people have ideas and they just let it sit uh, as opposed to taking action. And even though, you know, it only being six years in the in the business world, I think that's relatively short span of time. Right. For It's not too bad. And actually, the people who there were five uh, either individuals or groups uh, who pursued this and I tracked them all down and said, what happened? Why didn't you get this thing done? Right. And, you know, to summarize all that, I think they all ran out of gas. You know, finding the money to do something like this is a is an incredible challenge. And um, uh, I think they all ran out of gas. You know, I when I put the plan together, I thought it would be two to three years doors would be open. And sure. um, and it was six years. And but I, I, I have a knack for the long haul. You know, I've run a marathon. Uh, I have a graduate degree. I did all that, you know, night school, so to speak. I did all that on my own. Not many people uh, uh, take on a marathon and, and I've only done one, you know, but my, my wife and I did it together and um, but not not many people take on a marathon. Uh, and of those who do, not everybody finishes. Sure. And, yeah, that's um, that's a very impressive feat. I mean, a marathon is no joke. You know, it sounds. Yeah, it's no know, joke. It sounds right, less right. intimidating than it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, the point there is you have to be in it for the long haul. And that was something that I realized would be necessary. And it's something that I thought that I uh, had a, a pretty good experience in, had, you know, serving in special operations for 26 years and, um, you know, completing some other major milestones in my life. So this was something I was more than happy to take on. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Fin finish the mission. The job must be done, right? <laughs> that's it. Regardless that's of how exactly, long it you know, and, and that's, that's, I mean, my career in Navy EOD is it created the person who was able to then develop iFly Virginia beach. There's, there's no doubt that my experience and what I learned and the people that I worked for, uh, gave me the tools and it gave me the tenacity uh, to, uh, to use a word that a friend of mine, Paul Becker, uh, Admiral retired likes to use a lot. So, so it, it gave me, it gave me the mental attitude, the energy, the fortitude and, um, you know, in, in, in Navy EOD, uh, a, a good friend of mine who's a retired Navy SEAL, you know, he said, you, you Navy EOD guys, you guys are learning machines and you're problem solvers. And, um, and so I think that learning machine aspect is one of the things that uh, enabled me to to get iFly done. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I, I'm curious um, for you, Bob. Are there any pivotal moments or any highlights of that journey that really stick out to you as uh, a defining turning point where you were like <laughs> hustling and hustling and hustling and hustling and contact the city and they'll get back to you in two weeks? Like, are there right. any highlights or pivotal moments you like to uh, share from that journey? Sure. So uh, there, there are several, but I'll, I'll just I'll share the absolute one or two that jumped into my head as soon as you asked the question. Sure. Um, uh, of course, when you serve in the military for 26 years, you don't get rich. And this is a multimillion dollar project. And I didn't have multi a multimillion dollar bank account, meaning I had to find investors. I had to yeah. convince people that of two things, one, that this is a viable project uh, profitable and two, I'm the guy who can get this thing done. Right. Um, so I made a, I made a list of 10 investors, 10 potential investors. Initially, the first one said, no, the second one said no. And the third one, who is my current partner, the Breeden company, they said, well, we're, we're interested in this. Um, here's a whole bunch of questions we have. Why don't you go look all this stuff up and then come back and meet with us? You know, that process went on for a year. Uh, and then one day when I came back to meet with them, Ray Breeden uh, was in the room, uh, uh, the the patriarch of the company. Ah, the, the decision maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and 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 Ray said, uh, Bob, just talk talk me through this thing. You know, just wave tops. Talk me through this thing one more time. I talked him through it, and he said, Okay, um, let's let's go look at one. He said, So he said, Let's go look at one of these things. So we got it on his private jet, flew to Montreal. And uh, uh, actually, I flew up there a day ahead of time. Um, so when he arrived on his private jet, uh, like I knew exactly I had the rental car. I knew where we were going. I wasn't going to miss an exit. You know, I, I did route reconnaissance, if you will. <laughs> and uh, so so they they flew up to Montreal. 
I met him. We went and looked at the facility in Montreal. We talked to the owner and I rode on the jet on the way back to Virginia Beach. And it was on that jet that uh, that Ray said, let's get this thing done. Let's make it happen. Wow. So, uh, do you mind uh, letting us be a fly on the wall for that jet ride or that office boardroom conversation? Because I imagine the, the, the stakes were high. I mean, a red and blue wire is, is, is probably the only thing higher than that. But this is like second tier, you know, uh, very high stakes. What, what was it like for you? How was the experience the same as, as diffusing, you know, all the bombs that you'd worked on or was it a different type of intensity? What, what was it like? Yeah. I love the way you make the comparison between diffusing explosives and, and this moment, uh, because I've never, I've never compared the two before, but there's, there's similarity for sure. Yeah. You know, our body releases these chemicals based on what's going on, dopamine and serotonin and, and oxytocin and you know these are the most powerful drugs in the world and they're produced inside our body and when when we when we are pursuing something uh we have serotonin which energizes us and gets our critical thinking going and when we achieve when we accomplish the objective uh then we get this dopamine release meaning oh i feel so good oh i feel so great so uh so that serotonin that pursuit is is rewarding unto itself. And then the dopamine that you experience when you accomplish the objective, when when you cut the right wire or when when a potential investor says, let's get this thing done, it's a tremendous relief and it's this this euphoric feeling. But now I have a new, so I just crossed the finish line in securing investment, but now I've got a new start line right in front of me. You now know, the work now, begins. <laughs> yeah. So he says, okay, let's get this thing done. Now it's not convinced an investor. Now it's, holy cow, let's get this thing done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any, anytime, you know, you're you're in the pursuit of a decision, you know, you have the yes, the no, or the maybe. So you found the maybe, then you have to do the boardroom, then you have to do the jet ride and the actual, you know, boots on the ground. Now we're now we're at the the starting line to the project. Walk us through that next step. Maybe yeah, well, a, a highlight or two from from that experience. Sure. Looking well, you know the the really the next step is we're looking for a location, right? So where are we going to put this thing? And and that wound up being almost a three year endeavor unto itself. Um, and, and a lot of work with the city in that regard, and zoning and. Um, all, all the requirements to develop land. And of course, the Bretons are developers. They they are professionals uh, like nobody else. They know what they're doing. Um, and I was a, a total newcomer to all of that. You know, I had to, again, I had to be a learning machine throughout this entire process. I had to learn, I had to learn how to spell the word business when I decided to take this thing on. Um, you know, out of all the incredible experiences I've had in the military, reading, uh, uh, you know, business documents like a profit and loss statement or a cash flow statement or a balance sheet. Sure. It's not part of any military school I've ever been to. Um, so I had to learn, uh, I had to learn business, learn how to write a business plan, put all that together. Of course, that was all part of the secure the investor process. But now um, I had to learn development to a large extent, but also I had the strength and the experience um, and the power of the breeding company, which, which, you talk about, you know, I, 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 I couldn't have, um, I couldn't have landed a better partner in that regard, or, or really, you know, the breeding company brought this retired military officer under their wing and provided this incredible mentorship, um, in, in teaching me, you know, the business of running a business and, and, uh, bringing me on, on their team in, in a, in a, in some capacity. But to answer your question directly, the next thing was find a chunk of land, you know, out of all the available dirt in Virginia Beach, where are we going to put this thing? And the oceanfront made the most sense because of the tourist season and mom, dad, and the kids. Right. right? This, this is such an incredible activity for families to do. Kids as young as three up to, you know, there's no upper age restriction. We've had a 94-year-old in, in, in Virginia Beach, Biggie Tucker. Really? Is that the so, oldest, oldest you've had so far? That's the oldest we've had. Um, other, another iFly has had somebody 103 years old. Hmm. So um, it's just like a, you got a basic, record to beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're striving for it. We had a we had a 92 year old woman fly and she said, I bet I am the oldest flyer you ever had. And I was like, well, you're the oldest female flyer we've had. Um, there you go. But uh, but Biggie, Biggie Tucker was 94. So we had to find the dirt. <clears throat> we knew the oceanfront was the right place. And uh, so 
long story short, even though it's already been long, um, we had to work with the city. There was some municipal land. There was a municipal parking lot at, at 25th Street uh, that the city was willing to let somebody develop if it if it fit their criteria, which is mixed use. They didn't want just another hotel or just another apartment. They wanted um, a mixed use uh, facility or, or a mixed use uh, sure. you know development. So so again, with the incredible. Uh, experience that the Breeden Company brings. Um, their bread and butter is luxury apartments or high-end apartments. So we built three things as part of the project. We built um, a 147-unit apartment building, which is the Breedens. Uh, we built the parking garage, which the city owns and operates, and we built iFly. So we put uh, three functions on what was formerly just a, uh, a, a grade-level parking lot. Wow. What what a great use of resources and, and shout out to the breeding company because, you know, you kind of see their sign all around and it's just it's, part, <laughs> it's, it's sure like do. seeing the Virginia Beach Boulevard sign on the road, you know, just part of the culture, <laughs> part of the uh, the the vibe here. You know, they, uh, they've spent a, a lot of time and in, in investment in the community. So, yeah, yeah shout yeah. out to the breeding company for sure. Well, that's yeah. incredible. And also just the um, and, and not being in the commercial real estate side at all, but it makes total sense when you take a step back. But it's not just I fly. It's a project within a project. It sounds like good government when it works. <laughs> yeah, All the projects right, exactly. that everybody needs for it to benefit yeah. uh, everyone equally, you know, co comes into play here. That's uh, for, sure. for sure. That's awesome. But I bet you were stoked at that point. What was the what was the feeling? What was the emotion going on when you finally got that green light from the city? Um, yeah, you know, yeah, for you yeah. all to start breaking ground. Well, well, so there's euphoria initially, right? Again, it's that dopamine release, serotonin and dopamine, but more ser more serotonin, meaning more pursuit than than hey we're done you know Bob, your, we were, your master's degree is showing here <laughs> <laughs> we were just we were just getting going and um and and there's frustration there because you know uh three and a half or four of those six years was after we said let's get it done right we had to find the land we had to go through the process with the city to acquire the land and then you have to get permits and pulling permits for various phases of construction can be time consuming. And, you know, I love the 10 federal holidays that we have, but city workers don't work on those 10 federal holidays. And, you know, here, here we are on, on the, the precipice of a permit or an inspection. So you can move on to the next phase, you know, is our, is our, is our, uh, our rainwater management process, you know, did we get all that right in the site engineering? And, and, and so that process, again, totally new to me. Um, that, that took a long time. And, you know, when you hit roadblocks, uh, again, you just gotta, you gotta recognize it. You have to learn what to do, learn, learn what the, what the resolution is and then apply that solution. And, uh, so that was, uh, it was a long process. We, now I will say from the day we broke ground to the day we opened our doors was 11 months. So, so the construction process was not terribly long. Um, you know, we thought it would take six to nine it took funny? 11. <laughs> yeah. That's the funniest part, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well we've we, done it in uh, 11 months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it was a very technical thing to do here at the oceanfront because we had to go 25 feet deep to establish the foundation of what's called the plenum or what, one of the, one of the, it's just a big duct, but it's a big basement, basically the biggest basement you've ever seen. Uh, down here at the ocean front. So because the water table is five feet and we had to go 25 feet, you know, we had 120 well points and we were pumping water for six months. And so there was just extreme complexity in this project unto itself. And again, the um, the incredible capabilities of Breeden Construction, uh, Brian Revere, who I am still in contact with today, uh, is the president of construction for Breeden Construction. And um, this, uh, he's done many great things, but uh, I will claim that this is one of his greatest accomplishments. Absolutely. I, and so will we, that's the greatest accomplishment <laughs> right here. And yeah. and I deliberately asked these questions, uh, Bob and, and our viewers are probably like, why is Joe keep asking this question? It took a long time. We get it. But I want to emphasize just how determined you are in not only your business, but also the way in which you operate your character and also the way you operate your team as well, because the same drive and tenacity that you have for this six year ordeal, right, of thinking about it to planning and executing is the way you still operate your business and also your um, your leadership project now. I mean, just looking at your bio, I mean, 
you were, you're a consultant, you're a speaker, you're utilizing all these tools and continuing to learn and adapt. It's uh it's very admirable. So we're we're super stoked to have you have you in on this conversation. Just wanted to brag on you a little bit, Bob. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And and to 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 that end, real quick, you know, I heard somebody say, and I can't remember who it was or what, but I heard somebody talk about uh n- you know, not using your assets, like having these assets tucked away and you don't put them to use, and eventually you go away or the assets go away. And so there's this this wonderful thing that could have happened that never happened because somebody was unwilling to to put their resources uh, to work. And so, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a believer, like, you know, night school to get my, my bachelor's degree, the Navy offers to pay for 75% of my tuition if I'm just willing to go to school off duty. Yeah, that there's an asset that I'm going to put to use, you know? So, yeah. um, so, so all that, you know, that's kind of, uh, the, the way my, my, my brain works. I love it. I love it. So for, for our, our listeners here are like, okay, we're excited to go check out iFly. Would you mind sharing, uh, the location that you are now, uh, fully built brick and mortar shop. Uh, and then of course, uh, the products and services that you all offer at iFly just for, you know, quite frankly, a very exhilarating and, uh, exciting experience. Yeah, for sure. So to answer your question, no, I don't mind sharing at all. I'm happy to. And uh, so we are at 25th Street and Pacific Avenue down at the oceanfront. So the boardwalk is 1st Street to 40th Street. So we're near, you know, the midpoint on the boardwalk. So 25th Street and Pacific, right across the street from C.P. Shucker's restaurant. Wonderful friends of ours, uh, incredible neighbors, and they welcomed us to the neighborhood, uh, you know, the day we we put a shovel in the ground. So that's where we're located. Um standard hours, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the summertime and usually 10 a.m. till 7 or 8 p.m. Uh, uh, in the off season. Uh, as I said, kids as young as three can participate in what's called indoor skydiving. Now, indoor skydiving is kind of oxymoronic onto itself. Right? Yeah. Is there indoor. a plane involved? Uh, are you strapped right. to a middle-aged man? Like, how does how does this process work? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a flight chamber that is 14 feet in diameter and 52 feet tall. And the first uh, 14 feet from the what we call the floor level of the chamber floor, the first 14 feet up is all glass. So, so you're in this glass cylinder. Wind comes from beneath. And your body literally is floating on a cushion of air. <clears throat> now, when you're skydiving, and I've got about a thousand skydives, when you're skydiving, you are falling, but the relative effect of, or the effect of the relative wind is the same as in the flight chamber. If I'm falling through the air at 120 miles an hour, I've got a 120 mile an hour wind beneath me that I can manip- manipulate and maneuver. It's kind of like when you, stick your hand out of the car window and you do that, right? Yep. So relative wind is here. I put my hand up a little bit. The relative wind pushes my hand up. Or if I tip my hand down, the rel- relative wind pushes my hand down. Same thing when the wind is coming from beneath you. If I extend my legs out and bring my arms in, I'm, I'm essentially doing this, which drives me forward. If I If I push my arms out and bring my legs in, I'm essentially doing this, which now drives me backward so so it's that there's a little lesson in physics for you there you go we're, but, we're just a giant hand sticking out the car window at <laughs> i fly i love it I, I love that analogy i will literally be thinking about that next time i yeah, go yeah <laughs> yeah no it's it's the same it's the net effect of of you know the the force of wind and um so and we have variable wind speed so kids as young as three we you know we usually fly them around 40 or 50 miles an hour of wind speed Somebody my size, somewhere around 100 mile an hour of wind speed, and we can go up to 160 miles per hour. So in theory, no human body is too big for us to fly based on wind speed, but there are other uh, there are other weight restrictions for safety reasons, both for the flyer and for the instructor. So 259 pounds is our is our upper limit. Okay. Um, but kids as young as three. And one of the one of the wonderful things that we see every day is it'll be that three-year-old or that four-year-old or that five-year-old and and that child's mom and dad will be flying and mom and dad's mom or dad will be flying with them so three generations uh, having this experience together and it's it's a memory right it's something that 
uh, that people uh, talk about for the rest of their lives. The feedback that we get, if, if you go on our Google reviews or TripAdvisor, you'll see uh, you know, review after review that says, my 10 year old won't stop talking about that. Or, you know, finally something our 14 year old could do with our four year old, you know, it's just all these, this wonderful feedback. So, so it's a family affair in one capacity, Sure. Um, you know, mom, dad, and the kids, as I affectionately say, um, given my military background and kind of the, the, the basis to establish this business in Virginia beach, we do a lot of military training as well. As a matter of fact, it's going on right now. We do that on a daily basis in the building. Oh, wow. Uh, That's really cool too. Is there just one chamber that everybody kind of uh, participates in or are there multiple chambers? Yeah, no, just one flight chamber and uh, different, we, we do things in what we call blocks, usually okay. 30 minute blocks. So this 30 minute block could be for first time flyer families. And then the next 30 minute block might be military training. Um, so, and then the other way to look at indoor skydiving we, indoor skydiving is an amusement, it's a recreation, and it's also a sport. So you kind of compare it to ice skating. Um, and I'm a hockey coach as well. I've coached uh, high school hockey for the last four years. And um, But in, in ice skating, um, you might go one Sunday afternoon, one time a year, right? So that's, that's an amusement. You, sure. might go, you might go one Sunday out of every month or one Sunday out of every week. And now it becomes a recreational activity, something you do regularly that you're trying to get better at. Um, and then there's the sport of it, like, like competitive figure skating, um, where, you know, there's, there's sport, there's organization, there's objectives. And so all that exists within indoor skydiving. That's incredible. I mean, just the, the multifaceted aspects of it is, is really eye opening because you just think, it's a tube that people jump down, you know, and you can go really fast, really slow, and you can't be super small, but you also can't be super big. You know, it's, it's you know, the, the gross overgeneralization might turn people off of that, but just the fact that it's very intentional. I mean, there's science involved, there's math involved. Uh, obviously there's a great business owner behind it. You know, it's just all these elements come together to make, like you said, a very memorable and quite frankly, it sounds like a very compelling experience, you know, whether or not you like it, the idea at first or not, right. You got to, Take that for sure. Step. You know, one of the other things we have is a STEM program and our STEM program uh, is approved by the Virginia Department of Education and it aligns with what are called standard, what are called standards of learning. So in Virginia, we have these SOLs or these standards of learning based on elementary, intermediate, high school uh, level of, of uh, education. So our STEM program aligns with all three of those. We have a a uh, elementary STEM program. We have an intermediate STEM program. And then we have a high school STEM program. And it's facilitated by our general manager, Jason Laverius, who's also an instructor in the wind. Uh, he's a former Navy SEAL. He's a Naval Academy uh, engineering graduate. And he's been with this operation since, since the very beginning. And he's just an incredible teammate. And he loves doing STEM. And, and I encourage you or any any listeners to to just call and ask when our next STEM event is and come and watch 40 kids uh, do a, do some lab work, do some calculations on flight surface, and then watch these kids fly and just have the time of their life. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, really appreciate you sharing that too, because uh, a, a lot of our uh, guests on here, we talk about the importance of community and the aspect of just you know staying involved with things that might not necessarily have a immediate financial return and and all of our guests including yourself have been wonderful about doing that um uh, for those who might be interested in learning more about the stem program is the best way to uh, go about getting information just to give you guys a call directly is there anything yeah. on the website social media yeah so there's a couple things you can you can go to our website um or or you can go to youtube and uh just do a search for i fly virginia beach stem um that seems to be you know, if you want to see the video and get the nitty gritty, that seems to be the way to do things these days. Uh, yeah. Go to go to YouTube um, um, or you can call us here. 757-754-4359 uh, ask for Misty or Kendall who uh, custom build all of our STEM packages for various, the various schools. And, um, and again, both of those wonderful ladies have been with this operation from the very beginning as well. They've been here for uh, for about ten years now, and um, 
And so they know what they're doing when it comes to uh, making sure that uh, the objectives of, of the teachers and the schools are met and, and the children walk away from the experience going, that was awesome. So yeah. that's STEM. I want to tell you about one other thing. You mentioned community give back. Um, there's, there's another, if you Google SeaTac Soars or go to YouTube and search for SeaTac Soars, there's an elementary school four miles away from here called SeaTac Elementary. It's a Title I school, Achievable Dream Academy. And um, I went to a hockey coaching seminar a number of years ago, and I learned about this ice rink in Washington, D.C., that was, they were donating the ice time and the coaching for either figure skating or hockey for kids who otherwise uh, kind of inner city would not usually have access to, sure. to all things ice. And I came back here and I, I got my team together. I told them about my experience and I said, how can we do something similar with our wind chamber? And um, we, uh, we, we found SeaTac Elementary only four miles away. And we put together a 13 week program. Uh, so we do two groups of fifth graders, 12 fifth graders, 13 weeks before Christmas, and another group of 12 fifth graders, 13 weeks after Christmas. And we chose fifth graders because what we're doing with the program is building pride and confidence and really trying to inspire. And, um, and this is the, it's the coolest thing we do. We donate the whole thing. We have guest speakers come in. So, so the school bus brings the kids here at 3.30, drops them off. Um, they go up to our conference room, they put their gear down, uh, take a health and comfort break. Uh, we assemble in the classroom, a guest speaker, and, and people line up to be guest speakers. It's incredible. Uh, we have a wonderful community. They, people volunteer their time and go to the great effort to, to talk to these kids about things that they don't get in school, nor, nor should they get in school. But, um, uh, but it's just wonderful. So, so we'll have a guest speaker speak to the kids. I'm their first guest speaker. I talk about athleticism, ABC, agility, balance, coordination. Then I talk to them about ice hockey. And then, uh, 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 and then, and then we go on. But so we have a guest speaker. Uh, and then we feed the kids and then we fly them. And at six o'clock, uh, the, the bus takes the kids back to school or parents come and pick the kids up. But what's really cool about this is the school selects the kids for a variety of reasons. And when some of those kids show up on week one, day one, they look at the flight chamber. They've never been in the building before. And they go, I'm not sure I'm going to do this. Sure. By week 13, when we do what's called a showcase, we invite all the parents and all the teachers and, and, and you know, we, we bring some food and beverage in and, and we put on the showcase and these kids demonstrate what they've learned. When these kids, when their parents uh, arrive in the building and walk, come up to the second floor on the flight deck, these kids are just swinging their arms going, mom, dad, look at me, look at me. And uh, it's, it's emotional. It's really, uh, it's, the most incredible thing to see, uh, you know, to see the progress and the confidence uh, that these kids have gained. Yeah. I mean, and, and going back to mom, dad, and, and kiddo, just that opportunity to make that connection again in a way that doesn't have that necessarily cost associated with it. Right. It's, it's, it's an intentional program set out to help inspire those kids and, you know, maybe also in the same way, inspire the parents too, you know, yeah, hopefully that would be that would be cool, and it's and it inspires our teammates. So that SeaTac Source video, uh, it tells tells the story, and uh, one of our teammates talked about talks about how how those kids inspire him. So it's really cool, and uh, again, uh, uh, you know, the program has been evaluated and approved by Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We are a, an authorized after school program. Uh, we've received a partnership award from the city for what we do, and. And the feedback that we get from um, from um, Andrew Stark, who is the primary teacher uh, under this program, you know, he tells us about the gains some of these children uh, children are making in their lives and in school. You know, inspired by by what happens here, it's so rewarding uh, for my entire team to uh, you know to be able to do that for our community. Yeah, 
Wow. Absolutely. Bob, this has been an incredible conversation. I'm looking at the time and unfortunately I think you have to get back to it. So I definitely want to be respectful of your time and resources. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Uh, I have... can talk. People who know me know I can talk until tomorrow. So you're all fine. We really appreciate you sharing everything that's going on with iFly and I'll link uh, down in the description below those videos that you mentioned along with your website and social media profiles. That way folks can go out and check to see everything that's going on. I fly. Um, we got to get into our last section here, Rob, and that is going to be our rapid fire section. These questions Ooh, here we go. are quick, rapid fire. quick and fast. Answer with as much or as little information as you like. And let me pull up my notes here. Are you ready, Rob? Let's go. What's your favorite part of the indoor skydiving experience? Working with an incredible team. If you could fly with any historical figure, who would it be and why? Wow. Holy cow. Marcus Aurelius, um, yeah, because uh, yeah, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Stoic, Stoicism, flight, flight didn't exist back then. You know, the, the dream of flight did, but actual flight didn't. So I'd like to get his take on the whole thing. Perfect. And while you're talking with Marcus, you can ask him this question: What does skydiving symbolize for you in terms of life philosophy? Calculated risk taking, resulting in great success. Love it. Love it. And last one for you, Rob, what's the most common misconception about indoor skydiving that you'd like to set the record straight for? Uh, people, people say, oh, I have a fear of heights. I can't do that. Um, I don't like roller coasters. This is not a roller coaster. And when you fly, there's people sitting in seats right on the other side of the glass. You're three feet off the chamber floor. So there's no, there's no height, you know, that, that thing in your brain doesn't happen. And if you agree to go up high, we have something called a high flight where the instructor takes you up high. Again, it's not like a roller coaster where gravity is pulling you down. This wind is supporting you the whole time and it just tricks your brain into this euphoria of, I should feel like I'm falling right now, but I'm not, what's going on? And um, real quick, what I call the grumpy dad, right? Uh, the family shows up and dad's not real happy with because a family package is fairly expensive. And he says, we're paying all this money for what? So he's not real crazy about it. By the time we do that high flight with him, he's got a smile on his face as big as everybody else. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> right, you can, dad, you can still have fun too. That's right. You afraid of heights. Don't worry about it. Um, bad back. I have a bad back. Don't worry about it. Uh, ages three up to our oldest 94 years old. And um, kids with disabilities, that's the other coolest thing we do. We oh, yeah, literally sure. take kids in wheelchairs. So that there's another one for you. You can put in the links. I fly Virginia Beach and St. Mary's. And just find that one. Uh, incredible three-minute video of kids in wheelchairs. Uh, we bring them up to the door. They're wearing a flight suit and a helmet. And two instructors pull them out of their wheelchair and set those kids free. It is, it is, uh, it'll bring a tear to your eye. I don't, it doesn't matter who you are. Love it. Love it. Bob, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for carving out some time to chat with us. Um, we'd love to roll out the red carpet for you. Uh, any final words, messages, or information you'd like to leave with the audience? The floor is all yours. Yeah, real quick, you know, finishing an answer to a question you asked earlier, products and services. So, so we have the flight experience, obviously. Um, but we also do corporate training. We do leadership development and team building. And, and, you know, the concept was born of the flight chamber. Corporations would come here for a team building experience. And then they would ask us if we could provide a speaker on leadership or communication or team building, et cetera. And, and I have a lot of background and experience and all of that. So I developed this entire experience called Elevate Your Leadership. It's a one-day event that we do here at, at iFly Virginia Beach. And Tony Robbins has people walk across hot coals. We have people fly in a flight chamber. The net effect is that you, you have faced a fear or an anxiety and you tackled it with a group of people. And we all have expanded our comfort zone as a result of that. So, uh, so we offer this leadership development and team building. And then of course, I turn that into a book, Elevate Your Leadership, uh, just kind of a, a treatise on my experience um, it's not a textbook. It's not a academic journal. It's it's just. But if no you've enjoyed this conversation, definitely go check out the link and get a copy because it's 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 great resource. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Available on Amazon or in store here at iFly. 
but it's just a no BS uh, uh, book on my journey into leadership and success I've had and certainly failure that I've had. And, uh, and so, so those are all the things we offer. We got a big event coming up in January, a two and a half day, we call it the high flying mastermind. So we're going to have retired Navy SEAL, retired uh, Navy admirals. We're going to have all these guest speakers and we're going to do experiences. We're going to do a custom knife build with that. We're going to develop your warrior ethos and engrave that on your knife that you build. We're going to tour the battleship, Wisconsin. We're going to tour the MacArthur Memorial. We're going to visit the Navy SEAL monument down at the oceanfront and in and around all that, we're going to just, we're going to discuss leadership. It's going to be a great event. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll definitely have all that linked below. And then, of course, for our listeners who are listening after that timeline, the event has passed. Definitely follow us on social media, Discover Virginia Beach, and, of course, I Fly Virginia Beach uh, for all the latest events of what's going on here in the area. Rob, thank you. Thank you for your time. And with that said, thank you to our dedicated listeners for checking us out uh, for another episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a review, comment uh, of what questions you'd like me to ask next, and we'll see you all in another episode.